hello, I'm Ryan Thier. Uh, I will be presenting today on YOLO v3 and YOLO v4 convolutional neural networks. To start with, I will just start with a brief overview of the general features of convolutional neural networks for image analysis in general, uh, noting their increasing interest in recent years, discuss architecture and functionality, and finally talk about classification and comparisons between different frameworks. Uh, then we'll actually get into uh, YOLO itself. You only look once uh, with a overview of the YOLO architecture, uh, the specifics of versions three and four with their changes, advantages, and disadvantages. Uh, and then finally conclude with some examples from the literature uh, utilizing these frameworks in real applications, including agriculture, autonomous vehicles, gesture recognition, and facial recognition. So first, start with convolutional neural networks in general. Convolutional neural networks uh, are one of a subtype of many different types of artificial intelligence tools. Um, these AI tools have varying degrees of complexity and different applications. Um, on the simpler side, knowledge-based AI systems simply take a list of user-defined rules and apply them to select input data to produce an output. Uh, more advanced machine learning systems can be told to extract explicit features from given data sets, thereby learning to map input data and produce an output. And then finally, deep learning systems, uh, which includes convolutional neural networks, and we'll get into exactly what makes uh, a CNN a CNN, uh, can be taught to extract many simple features and build complex relationships between them to identify specific phenomena in data subset. Convolutional neural networks are a subset of deep learning, which perform convolutions and other operations along the way. We'll get into this more later, but it makes them adept at processing images. Uh, just to start off with, for some context, uh, there's been quite the explosion in interest in both convolutional neural networks and the YOLO framework itself over the past year. As you can see in the chart shown here with data taken from the Web of Science database, there's been explosive growth in published results for both convolutional neural networks in general, as well as YOLO framework papers. Both classes of papers have seen more than a 10x growth in publications per year since 2014, up past 24,000 for convolutional neural networks and over 100 for YOLO papers in 2022. This speaks both to the high power of these applications, in many cases, the ability to classify live video feed in real time with only tens of milliseconds latency, as well as the wide variety of uses of these systems from identifying microstructural features in TEM image data to classifying apples in real time, as we'll show at the end of the presentation with some examples. So just to start with a brief overview of convolutional neural networks in general, uh, this just kind of shows from left to the right, the feed of the input uh, through the various uh, layers, and then finally to the classification output. Um, so the image classification, object detection, and image processing are all possible depending on the uh, system precisely used. Uh, input image data is convoluted by passing a filter over the image and performing tensor multiplication. The data then may be pooled to reduce its size while retaining most of the accuracy. Then, the feature is subsequently classified and a prediction of its nature is made. Whole image may be identified, the feature may be boxed, its outline may be masked, whatever the task is, depending on the system itself. Uh, convolution step uh, is a very critical core building block of convolutional neural networks. Here's a simple diagram showing uh, a uh, quantified representation of a pixelized input image uh, multiplied by uh, some applied filter and then producing a subsequent output array. Uh, color images read in three-dimensional tensors corresponding to the red, green, blue pixel information. The filter moves across the image, checking if the feature is present, and the input and filter are multiplied to produce an output called an activation or convolved feature. An activation function applied measures whether a feature is or is not what it's looking for, depending on the biases and weights determined during the training process and used to inform the model. Successive layers of convolution operations can stack the information received in prior layers. For example, in identifying a bicycle, each individual part of the bike identified frame, the handlebars, the tires, and so forth, make up a lower level pattern in the neural network, which later combine to represent the overall pattern 
that is the bicycle being sought. Uh, a key second uh, piece of the puzzle here is the pooling operation. Here you can see a sequence from the activation with a rectified linear function uh, where the uh, most important uh, information is uh, preserved and the uh, less important information is stripped away followed by the pooling operation, which reduces uh, the total amount of information. Uh, pooling can also be referred to as downsampling. In short, it reduces the number of parameters uh, in the input. Similar to a convolution uh, filter, which is sometimes also called a kernel, sweeps across uh, the incoming array. It does not have any weights in contrast to convolution, but rather it aggregates or condenses large arrays of information into more compact ones. In the example above, Activation strips out the negative values in the input, and then pooling extracts the largest quantity in each quadrant to produce an additional array. This process does lose some information, but it speeds up and simplifies later steps. Optimizing this pooling process is an important part of applying neural networks. Uh, finally, classification here in this system shows a kind of a brief workflow uh, showing the, in this simple case, classifying whether an input image contains a cat with a simple yes or no binary. Just prior to classification, the convoluted and pooled outputs are flattened down into one dimension, converting a multidimensional tensor into a one-dimensional array. Final layers of the network connect to all the previous activations in the prior layer, so-called fully connected layers. They classify based on the features extracted in the prior steps. Typically, Final layers use classification based on the prior activization activations, pardon me, combining the various weights and biases to make a probability prediction from zero to one as to whether an image or feature satisfies the necessary criterion to be identified as the sought after object. Uh, just be last thing before moving on to the OLO models themselves is to just discuss a few important parameters that crop up in discussing some of these frameworks, uh, namely the uh, intersection over union, IOU ratio and the mean average precision. Um, so the intersection over union is a ratio describing how well the predicted bounding box that is eventually applied over a feature circumscribes an object relative to the ground truth box. The uh, ground truth box is the so-called the ideal condition. You might think of it as something, you know, something you might manually define during training, the uh, the reference value. Uh, a couple of things to consider uh, include precision, which is a measure of how well you can find true positives out of all positive predictions, and recall, which is a measure of how well you can find true positives out of all predictions. Low precision, high recall results in most positive features being identified, but false positives are prevalent. Uh, low recall, high precision means positive features are largely correct, but some get missed. If multiple classes are present, for example, if cows, horses, and sheep are all separate classes being identified in pictures of farmyard scenes, then the mean average precision, so-called MAP, will calculate the average precision for each of the animals, uh, in, in other words, the average precision for each class in the sample set, and then take the mean of all of those averages. Uh, this MAP is, can be used to compare uh, different frameworks uh, working on a given set of hardware and working through a given data set. Uh, so now we get into YOLO. You only look once. Uh, here's a, just a brief diagram showing uh, kind of the high level process of how YOLO is applied. YOLO is an object detection algorithm that can operate in real time using the convolutional neural network techniques discussed above. It is called you only look once because a single neural network predicts bounding boxes and class probabilities directly from full images in one evaluation. The network simultaneously predicts bounding boxes and class probabilities for those boxes, training on full images and directly optimizing detection performance. The image is divided into an S by S grid, predicting B bounding boxes and confidence scores for those boxes. Each box has uh, five parameters, X, Y, W, H, and the confidence. X and Y are the center coordinates of the box relative to the grid cell. Uh, and width and height are predicted relative to the whole image. A confidence value reflects the intersection over union ratio uh, discussed previously uh, between the predicted and ground truth boxes uh, for the final detection. Uh, 
here's a bit more uh, detailed view of the sequence of uh, ar architecture uh, in the original YOLO model. Um, so moving from left to right through the uh, convolutional layers, finally to the fully connected layers and out. Um, for the caption, the network has 24 convolutional layers followed by two fully connected layers. Alternating one by one convolutional layers with three by three convolutional layers uh, reduces the feature space from preceding layers. The final layer predicts both class probabilities as well as bounding box coordinates. The bounding box width and height are normalized to those of the image in order that both fall between one and zero. The final activation function is a linear function, but all prior uh, activations use the rectified linear function shown in the top right of the screen up here. Uh, in other words, it just for negative values, uh, the slope is, or the, uh, the uh, output value is highly decreased. Um, so now we'll get into the specifics of YOLO v3 and what uh, was adapted in that over the initial iterations of YOLO and then what the outcome of that is for the performance of the framework. Um, so a series of small tune-ups and additions were made in v3 to improve uh, the overall performance. Um, overall, YOLO v3 runs faster than other detection methods with comparable performance, uh, as you can see in the above figure on the left, showing uh, inference time, kind of a, a measure of performance or, or quickness on the x-axis, and then the COCO average precision, where COCO is uh, just kind of a common benchmark that's uh, used to compare uh, various neural network frameworks. And you can see in, in the start items, for uh, roughly the same precision, uh, YOLO v3 is, in this case, faster than what they were comparing it to uh, retina net uh, variations. Uh, V3 introduces, uh, so bounding box predictions, now four parameters um, with four coordinates per box and an objectness score, evaluating how well the bounding box overlaps with the ground truth box. Classification is done by multi-label classification, i.e. each box may contain more than one class, which is helpful for complex data sets with overlapping labels. Um, possibly the largest change in YOLO v3, or the most significant one, is that it predicts boxes at uh, three different scales. Uh, in other words, from the original pixel size of the image, say if that's uh, 256 by 256, in subsequent uh, steps, it will uh, downsample um, into uh, in kind of coarser arrays, getting more meaningful information from the upsampled features and finer grained information uh, from the, the uh, f first uh, largest feature maps, which helps with detecting features of disparate sizes, uh, small versus medium versus large compared to the original image. Uh, additionally, uh, the, the feature extractor now has 53 convolutional layers, up, which is shown in the chart on the right here, um, compared to the original 19. Uh, this is the so-called uh, darknet 53 backbone. Uh, it's much more powerful, but still efficient, forming comparably to other frameworks like ResNet, but much more computationally efficient. Um, YOLO v3 is very popular, but it does have some disadvantages. Um, so in this table, uh, the AP values along the top of the screen indicate various average precision uh, measurements. And on the rightmost section, the S, M, and L subscripts refer to small, medium, and large, respectively. Um, so you can see here, I've highlighted a couple of values for YOLO v2 and YOLO v3 compared to some other uh, neural nets. And you can see that uh, particularly for small features, the uh, YOLO frameworks are much less accurate than some of the uh, comparable frameworks. However, uh, the authors note that while it, it is much worse, uh, in this case, YOLO v3 compared to, say, RetinaNet is about three times faster. So which is better depends on your specific use case conditions. And uh, v3 was a large upgrade from v2 in this respect. Um, YOLO's primary advantage over other frameworks is its speed and efficiency um, with some minor sacrifices in accuracy. These are attributes apply to the training process too meaning YOLO is ideal for cranking through large sample sets with lots of data, for example, traffic information or fruit separation, where you have lots and lots of samples um, to train on. In contrast, this makes it uh, potentially less suited for smaller data sets or niche models where every bit of accuracy is necessary. Um, 
YOLO v4, I guess I should take a step back here and just mention that uh, YOLO versions one through three were created by a researcher at the University of Washington, uh, Joseph Redman, who actually stopped working on YOLO after v3 due to his concerns about the potential surveillance and military applications of the work. Um, after that, you know, because all of this is relatively out in the open, uh, an individual named Alexei Bachovsky proceeded to continue to work on YOLO v3 and with some other collaborators and make an updated version called uh, YOLO v4. I just thought it was interesting here. So I included uh, this post I had found from the original creator, basically confirming that uh, it's out It's out in the world now. It's out of his hands. And it, it just, this also stood out to me because um, I think the original YOLO paper has something like 7,000 citations at this point. And there is evidently an explosion of private companies um, trying to cash in on this very exciting technology. So it was striking to me that... Uh, he would walk away from all that on somewhat of a moral standpoint. So I, I wanted to make a note of it. Uh, back to the differences and the kind of under the hood, so to speak, for YOLO v4. Um, YOLO v4 modifies a number of aspects of YOLO v3 uh, with an effort to improve accuracy without sacrificing performance. Um, so here's shown is kind of a rough uh, high level process flow for YOLO v4, um, including the addition of a sparse prediction pass through, which is aggregated at the end of the process uh, alongside the convoluted layers result. Um, so the sparse pass through takes layers before being convoluted and passes them to the end of the process where they are aggregated to the standard convoluted layers. Uh, and there's a couple other additions uh, to this framework as well, that the so-called bag of freebies and the also equally fun named bag of specials. Uh, the bag of freebies refers to several offline training modifications that improve model accuracy. This includes things like data augmentation, you know, increasing the variability and number of input images so the detection model has higher robustness for images from different environments. The bag of specials refers to plug-in modules that increase the inference cost by a small amount, but significantly improve accuracy. Um, this can include plug-in modules that strengthen feature integration, uh, or uh, screen model prediction results before their final before the uh, full execution of the network has completed. Uh, in comparison, uh, YOLO v4 achieved uh, pretty significant improvements over v3. You can see here that um, so a very large uh, for a given uh, FPS frames per second throughput here. So this blue curve kind of this corresponds to uh, video feeds in real time. Um, the significant increase in average precision for a given FPS value between YOLO v3 and YOLO v4. Uh, this is a pretty significant leap um, just from a cursory glance that I took. Subsequent versions, um, i.e. YOLO v7, had a uh, much kind of smaller incremental increase in average precision relative to their prior versions. Um, so this is a pretty significant step overall in the evolution of the YOLO framework. Uh, now we'll get into sharing some examples from the literature that have made use of these frameworks and you know, some real practical examples, uh, and especially highlighting some of the strengths of uh, the YOLO framework compared to some other frameworks. Uh, so the first example is for apple detection during different growth stages in orchards using uh, the, an improved YOLO v3 identification model. So as the authors note here, uh, real-time detection of apples is really important for judging growth stages and estimating yield. Here, YOLO v3 was used to detect apples during different growth stages with different illumination, backgrounds, and ambient conditions. You can see in this figure here, the similar um, kind of stock flow path that I showed at the very beginning of the pres presentation here is actually uh, being applied to the researcher subject, in this case, apples. Um, they expanded the input data set by uh, augmenting the original images with rotation, color balance adjustments and blurring the images. Uh, and here you can see the results in that they've uh, got pretty good um, intersectional reunion ratios for basically each type of, of apple that they defined here in various stages of growth between young, expanding, and ripe. They concluded that YOLO v3 was superior to the faster RCNN and VGG16 uh, convolutional neural networks which at, they said that uh, at the time VGG16 was the state-of-the-art fruit detection model. Uh, and we're excited about taking next steps to apply these results to yield estimation and other practical things. Um, another application of this is in uh, 
surroundings identification for autonomous driving. Uh, here, of course, false positives in autonomous driving applications can lead to you know fatal accidents and horrible destruction. So increasing accuracy while preserving detection rate is crucial for this application. Here, the researchers modified the LOV3 loss function uh, to improve uh, the average precision. And you can see here, the top row of images is using kind of the stock uh, LOV3 package, whereas the bottom row of images uh, uses their, their modified loss function. And you can see in, in many of these, uh, for example, the bus here on the right, you know, their modified version uh, really tightens up the, the bounding criteria of the boundary box uh, for uh, each thing in the, in the identified classes. Similarly with this truck too, you can see it's kind of hanging off here, but they've got it uh, very tightly described here. Uh, and it was concluded that Yolo V3, uh, their modified algorithm that is, was uh, the most suitable at the time for autonomous driving applications. Um, next, there was a, uh, uh, these researchers were working on uh, gesture recognition systems, which are, can have a wide variety of uses, um, not limited, including, but not limited to um, virtual reality and augmented reality uh, technologies, um, assisted living, uh, cognitive development assessment, uh, as well as industrial applications like human robot interactions in manufacturing and control of autonomous cars. Um, so in this paper, they modified a, or they uh, adapted Yolo V3 um, to develop a uh, framework for uh, picking up in real time uh, hand gestures. And the figure on the top here shows relatively high degree of accuracy uh, that they were able to achieve uh, and uh, the bottom left shows some examples of here where one, two, three, four, and five refer to the number of digits that the framework is uh, observing that the hand is holding up. Finally, the last example I have is regarding face mask detection using Yolo V3. Um, so the benefits of wearing masks to prevent COVID-19 are widely known at this point. So there's some interest in uh, being able to determine uh, who or what proportion of people in a space are wearing masks uh, in real time. So uh, the figure on the right here shows some examples of facial analysis with determining whether or not someone is wearing a mask or not. Uh, and these researchers compared uh, Yolo V3 to faster RCNN in order to achieve this task. Um, the authors trained both models on a data set consisting of the same images of people with and without masks. Uh, and arrived at the uh, results shown below. So you can see that YOLO V3 had a uh, slightly lower average precision than the faster RCNN model, but the with the uh, much faster inference time uh, of YOLO V3, the authors concluded for uh, real-time uh, uh, recognition of this kind of data set, uh, that faster response uh, made YOLO3 the superior choice for this case. Um, yeah, so in conclusion, I've gone over some of the results of, or the basics of convolutional neural networks and the uh, specifics of YOLO versions three and four relative to the original uh, deployment and architecture of that framework. And then shown some examples that uh, it's, it seems definitely seems to me that uh, YOLO is uh, only becoming more popular. And I think uh, Yolo V7 at the, the most cutting edge at this point uh, is uh, continuing to uh, make improvements on the results shown here. And with that, uh, these are the references I used in assembling this. And that concludes my presentation. Okay. Uh, well, I have some questions here. So if I give you an image that contains helium bubbles, so you, uh, can you point out on those image and they are getting trained for YOLO, that means you are annotating a box around it when you start training it. And I have some output where boxes are there on the voids and some of the boxes are not at the right position. Can you point out in the image what are true positive, false positive, true negative, and false negative in case of YOLO? Uh, just on any of the 
sample set. So yeah, any you know, any sample, even you can use one of your images. But this is slightly, uh, yeah, this is in yellow. This um, slightly tricky. Um, I think I, I mean, I mostly most of my references here were. I mean, the most of the papers I picked, you know, the, the author shared uh, successful applications rather than than failed ones. But um, a, you know, false positive. So a true positive is correctly finding the right thing. Right. A false positive would be uh, identifying something that is, or identifying something as belonging to a class when it doesn't in fact belong to that class. So for example, in this image, if there was two classes, taxis and buses, and this, this box was uh, marked as the bus class, that would be a false positive. But then a true negative would be uh, missing a correctly not identifying a feature as a uh, belonging to the given class, whereas a false negative would be uh, missing something that truly belongs to that class. So in this case, there would be a box around, uh, or if there was no box around this bus, that would be a false negative because there is a bus and they incorrectly identified it as a negative not belonging to the bus class. That means if it misses an object that was marked in your ground truth, right? If it misses an object that you marked in your ground truth, you know, that would be classified as true negative, right? Makes sense, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So now this was slightly tricky because all these uh, people get very confused. Okay, they know when they start training the model, uh, they know this thing that if you're providing the box around an object, that's a true positive. If your model gives the box at the same place. So it's basically um, the intersection of the boxes that you provided with the ground truth. If there is one-to-one -one intersection, that's they all are true positive. And if there are extra bo boxes it has provided, they becomes false positive, all the extra boxes. Now coming right. to the negative class, as you told that, if it has missed something, right, where it had to do, that will be your true negative. Right. And I think similarly applied for false negative. Okay, another quick question. From YOLO 1, uh, you went also to YOLO V1. Uh, and YOLO V1 to YOLO V3. So in YOLO V1, um, the main change that you have a higher precision in YOLO V3, there's a concept of anchor boxes. Uh, any comment on that? Because YOLO V1 doesn't use anchor boxes. And because of that, what was happening is if uh, your grid has two objects, the center of two objects is present in a grid, then it doesn't know how to, how to take it further. That's why they introduced the concept of anchor boxes, where they were, you know, localize everything and they were trying to do a regression with respect to the anchor boxes. Yeah. I see. Yeah, I did read about them. To, I Frankly, I didn't feel that I understood the distinction between mm -hmm. anchor boxes and the ground truth boxes well enough to be able to speak to it um, compared to some of the other distinctions that I picked up here. But uh, yeah, that... Uh, uh, yeah. Because my main concern was the MAP values that you show, they become very high for V3, right? Um, uh, MAP value, the table of comparison that you provided. Here. Um, I think in the, um, in the conclusion, in the slide that you were comparing MAP values. Mm -hmm. Yes, here. So these were the MAP values where, you know, it refers to small, medium and large objects. And for small objects, so the main uh, main thing that we noted 
the biggest change was 5 to 18 for the smaller objects. Now, YOLO V3 uh, started working very well for the smaller objects. And one of the reasons that um, we know is it started using 53 convolution layer. So uh, it started taking the details of the tiny objects um, really uh, nicely. So this was one thing. But what are the other thing that um, we could talk about here that might have changed? Uh, well, I mean, you could also point to just the general 50% increase in average precision between V2 and V3. Um, that is from 21.6 to 33 here. Um, Why do you think there's such a great improvement? What was changing in YOLO V3? You know, YOLO V1, V2, V3, they are very uh, important version because there was a lot of change introduced within them. Like then V4, V5, V6, it's, it's very little change. But uh, from V1, for example, they had fully connected layers at the end. But in V2 and V3, they removed the fully connected layer, which is a big change because if you remember, a fully connected layer is a layer that consists of neurons. That means it does all kind of uh, probability calculation. That means an image, it is flattened into a matrix and then is entering into fully connected layer. So after max pooling, everything that we do, it's flattened into one dimension and then it is getting into the neurons, right? However, um, in uh, V2 and V3, they removed the fully connected layer. So I wasn't, uh, you know, it was very interesting to read that how in that case, it is still doing the classification because classification is mainly done, you know, on the probability basis, right? Uh, it thinks it, the uh, algorithm, it finds its nearest neighbor while training and then tries to compute the probability based on that. So any idea on, on that, like V2 removed the fully connected layer, V2 also introduces the concept of anchor boxes. It used the dark net. Then what started happening in, in, in V2 was it started doing uh, the classification and a detection at every scale, small, medium, and large. That's why we don't have V1, because V1 it does not uh, provide that. V1 only does it at one scale. And that's why they were using the concept of bo bounding boxes rather than um, anchor boxes. So this uh, was one uh, addition here. Sure. Other than that, um, yours was YOLO V4, right? Um, and what happens, how is the precision changes on V4? Uh, well, I tried to touch on that in, yeah, right. let me see. In this slide, I had a relatively high level. I, so I, I found the original, the, uh, you know, the actual paper, uh, published on YOLO V4, uh, outlining it to its debut, so to speak. And uh, I found it somewhat difficult to break apart, but uh, I tried to include what I perceived to be the significant changes here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, because these are bag of PVs and bag of uh, specials are the main uh, two changes that it has, right? Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we don't have the precision values for V4 here, right? Um, just in this comparison that was published in that paper, mm -hmm. but not tabulated. Right, so if you see here, it's in frame per second, it's gone from 33 YOLO V3 versus 44. It's, it's an MAP improved by 10%. Right. Yep. And any idea why we have uh, this improvement? Like what's core changing? Because you know why this thing is important? Because for example, I give you a data set and I give you a data set where you have a voids and you have a voids of all similar sizes, 10 nanometer, 10 nanometer, 10 nanometer. 
You don't worry, you don't care. You simply applied YOLO V1, you are good. Now I give another data set to you in which you have a, what do you call as double, double population? Bimodal. Bimodal. That one, what happens is you have a smaller population and you have a bigger population. You have two different scales of the same object. Now you will start using V2 and V3. Now I give you another data set in which there is an, you know, what are occluded objects? Occluded object is like one object is hidden behind the other. For example, if I hold a book here, my face is hidden behind it. In the same ways, you know, in your microstructures, you have a void which is hidden behind another void. A lot of times you just don't see the projection is overlapped. Sure. In that case, we use, you know, a V4 and even higher version because they introduced more of the loss functions there. So that's why depending on the data set we have, we use a particular version um, and having this kind of comparison, it makes it a little bit easier. Um, uh, easier to you know uh, take it a first step when you start analyzing your samples. Okay, but overall uh, good understanding and good presentation. Thank you.